weeks the dawn Morning awakes creation's song And with the rising sun War comes alive to carry on The light of light is shining on The dark of night can overcome The light of light that burns so bright Can take the wrong Let strange arrow hit you. Every day people pray. They'll find the strength to make it through. While there is one who waits to fill their hearts with life and oh, the light, the light is shining. This is moment of refreshing. And we are going to start out with a general topic that is going to be known as the end time and you. What did I say? The end time and you. For you to be part of this, you have to know what is called the end time. That means you have to be familiar with the word of God. We have to be familiar with the scriptures. I welcome you to the concourse of the scriptures. I welcome you to the place where we discuss the wisdom of God made perfect through his word. Amen. This is what we're going to be doing for weeks to follow. We're going to be looking at contemporary events as fulfilled in prophecy, biblical prophecy. Amen. We're going to be looking at how we can get prepared for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the end time and you, praise the Lord. I know, I want to believe that you know that we are in the end time. This is the time where the Bible prophecies are fulfilling in, in great rapidity. And we ought to know what we are doing at this time. I, I, I just want you to know that the Bible has given all of us different assignments. The, the Spirit of God has given us different assignments, and we are supposed to fulfill purpose upon the earth. That is why God has called those of us in the Fortizo ministry to, with the word of God to enlighten, illuminate the saints about the issues, all those radio points that the people, people pre think that they are mysteries and they, are, they cannot be understood. Our responsibility is to illuminate you by the word of God. The Bible says, if our gospel is hid, is hid from them who the God of this world has blinded their minds. So to an extent, blindness, blindness is, not, is not total lack of sight. Even partial lack of sight in, in a particular area is a measure of blindness, but God will help all of us. It is by his grace that we stand. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to start by this. Are we in the end time? Yes, we are in the end time. But now, we under the general topic of the end time and you, we are going to deal with, we are going to consider a very contemporary event that is going on right now. How many of you have been watching Sky News, CNN, uh, Al Jazeera, and all of these uh, uh, news organizations that cover news all over the world? You will notice that apart from other events, one e e event that has one, one occurrence and things that have been going on right now for about three or four months now is the, is the uh, instability and the commotion going on in Ukraine. Right now, as I speak to you, the president of Ukraine, the new president, announced a unilateral ceasefire between the, the battle that was, that the war that has been going on between the Ukrainian forces and the, 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 the pro-Russian separatists at the, at the east side of Ukraine. And if you recall, about a month or two ago, a portion of Ukraine, Crimea, carved themselves out of Ukraine because they were, they were given protection by Russian forces under President Putin. What are the implications of these things? Do they have any relevance with the scriptures? 
What is going to be the end of these things? What should a believer note out of these things? What should a believer do? The Bible says, watch and pray. Yes, we can pray, but what, before we pray, we should watch. What are we watching? If you don't know what you try to watch, you will be praying amiss. Praise God. So that is why God has put it in our spirit to study the scriptures. Do you know that what is going on in Ukraine and Russia and everywhere on this part, they have to do, their, their roots are in the scriptures? I want to give you a little bit of background. About three or four years ago, something started that suddenly there was uprising that started in Tunisia and it spread to all other Arab, Arab nations. And it went and went and went around until there were Forci they, they were forced, there were forceful change in government. Egypt is still, is still trying to ca come out of its own. Instability everywhere. Why did the government of all these Arab nations change within a period of about four or five years? Why? Is there anything that happened that the scripture has not given us any clue about? No. It is our, it is our responsibility to cite these things out. Now, I want to start today by looking at a scripture. Let's start from this scripture in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. Jesus was asked a question by the disciples on the famous Mount Olives. They had just taken the Lord to the temple to, to just for him to admire, for him to, to assess and uh, give, him, give him a chance to also comment positively about the Herodian temple, which was the third temple in standing. Because Solomon built the first one, uh, Zerubbabel and the others built a, a refurbished one. Then Herod came and was financed by the Romans and built the magnificent temple at that time, at the time of the physical physical existence of Jesus here called the Herodian Temple. Um, I would like us to quickly look, if you want to, now let me tell you, let me tell you, sirs, this is a teaching ministry, purely teaching ministry, and we're going to be following the scriptures. So anytime you hear about moments of refreshing, call a friend, call a brother, get your Bible and open your Bible, get a sheet of paper, you're going to have a lot of teaching to do. Just assume that you are in the Bible study. You are in the class. Amen. Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. I, I want you to hold on there. I want you to notice that the, 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 the disciples took him to the temple with the belief that he was going to be, he was going to appreciate the beauty of the temple and he was going to make positive statements about it. You can imagine how shocked they were when Jesus started saying these words that seem negative. He said, there shall not be one stone left on top of another. That means there was going to be a total demolition of such a magnificent edifice. Now, I want you to take a note, because this is teaching ministry. I want you to take a note of something. He said they came to show him the buildings of the temple. Wait a moment. I thought the temple was supposed to be one single building. Why did it now become buildings of the temple? The secret there was that if you don't build according to God's pattern, you will have your own new ideas. Actually, over time, because of the various ideas of men that were added, the building that was standing at that time, the Herodian, the Herodian temple, had been added with a lot of embellishments. It was not built according to the pattern that was given to David anymore. Solomon built according to the pattern that God gave his father, David. But over time, along the line, apostasy set in. The finances to build the temple came from unbelievers, came from the Romans. 
the Romans financed the building of the temple through Herod to, 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 to appease the Jews so that the Jews would be less restless. So they gave money, and there was so much abundant money and because the idea of the rebuilding of the temple was not something that was sought out from the Lord, Herod built from a political mind, and so he added a lot of things that God did not ask for. That was why they referred to it here as buildings of the temple. There were so many things that were not part of it. And do you know the most important thing that is that makes the temple the temple was the presence of God. The presence of God was the most important furniture in the temple. Do you know that this temple, as big and magnificent as it was, had not the, the presence of God? And when I'm talking about the presence of God, that was the Ark of Covenant. This building was magnificent, big, beautiful, marbles, chandeliers, all kinds of uh, ceramic tile styles and different things, and yet the ark of the Lord was missing. Remember from the days of Jeremiah, God has said that the ark had disappeared and it was not going to be remembered anymore. So the presence of God had left being inside the box. It has now changed to being inside a person. And the person that the ark of the Lord was, was the Lord Jesus Christ and his son, spiritual sons. So the temple was actually barren of God's presence, but it was beautiful. There's a difference between beauty and glory. One day we're going to look at that. Okay? There's a difference between something that is beautiful and something that is glorious. Amen. So Jesus said the temple was going to be destroyed. And the disciples were disturbed. And they quickly hushed him and took him out of the place because the Jews who were nearby will have stoned all of them. Okay? Because that was the pride of the Jews at that time. Now listen to me. There are things that, are, that people, people hold in high esteem, but to God they are abominable. Note that. There are things that men highly put value on, but to God they are abominable. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall all these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, notice the Lord was asked three questions there. Many people are not aware that there are three distinct questions. Okay? And note, the disciples took Jesus to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was a distance, of a walking distance, of, uh, some distance away from the Temple Mount, but they are all in the same area of the range of the, temp of the, of the mountains there. And they asked him privately. The reason why they asked him privately was that they felt that the comment he made in the temple was provocative and explosive. And if the Jews had that, they were, it was going to incur the wrath of the Jews upon them. So they took him to a secluded place and said, Rabbi, when shall... They were worried. I mean, if it were you, you would be worried as well. When shall these things be? What, are, what do you mean by what shall these things be? When will this prophecy that the temple was going to be destroyed, when is it going to happen? That's number one. Then number two, when, what shall be the sign of thy coming? That means they had already said to that issue that Jesus was going to come back again. Mr. Christian, are you aware that Jesus is coming back again? He went away and promised that he's coming back again. The disciples, as far as, far back as 2,000 years ago, were looking forward to his coming back. How much more we who are living at this end of time, we should be very attentive, watching and waiting towards the second coming of the Lord. That's number, the second question. And then they asked the third question and said, and the sign of the end of the world. The sign of the end of the world. I want you to notice that we are, we are reading the King James uh, translation of the Bible. Now, actually the word end of the world there ought not to be the end of the world. It ought to be the end of the age. 
substitute the word world there to age, then you will get it right. What they're asking for, what, what shall be the sign of the end of the age? Because this age is going to end. Hallelujah. We have been in a particular age and it's going to end. Now let me tell you something. For those of us who don't know, God has a plan for this particular uh, human existence. There is a plan for it. And in the plan for the end of the age, there are errors of dispensation. There are errors of dispensation. Uh, theologians generally agree that there are seven distinct dispensation now ages within this age of Adamic existence. What I mean by Adamic existence, from the time the Lord created Adam and put him in the garden and said, be multiply and replenish and subdue the world. He said, replenish the earth, subdue the earth, have dominion over animal creation, eat up some fruit, till the ground, be fruitful, multiply. And no, that was the Adamic charge. And all human beings that are living, we are all from Adam, if you believe in the truth of creation. Amen. And so, under the human existence, from the time Adam started, the Adamic age started, God has a plan. And the Bible clearly shows us, and all theologians believe that there have been seven segments. So there will be seven segments, and we are in the sixth segment. There is what is called the first dispensation, which is the dispensation of innocency, dispensation of conscience, dispensation of human government, dispensation of promise, dispensation of the law, dispensation of grace, and the coming dispensation of the kingdom. Let me define what a dispensation is. A dispensation is a period of time during which Man is tested in respect to obedience to some specific will of God. Now, at a, for a period of time, God will reveal his will. And that particular will, God will now test the whole human race in relation to their obedience to that revealed will. So for that period of time, God is going to test every man with respect to their obedience to that revealed will instruction. And the period of that is what is called a dispensation. So theologians believe that there are seven dispensations, and I come again, innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. Praise the Lord. And the disciples are now asking, what shall be the end of the age? That means when all the seven dispensations will finally be consummated. Praise the Lord. And you will notice that the answer the Lord gave immediately was that, take heed that no man deceives you. And I want to give us an assignment, every child of God, who want to grow in grace and the knowledge of God. I want you to take, your, take time with your Bible. Read the whole of Matthew chapter 24, and from verse 4 all the way down, you will see all the signs that the Lord gave concerning the answers to those three things. When the temple was going to be destroyed, the sign of his coming, and the sign of the end of the age. They are different things entirely. The, the, the temple, at the time the temple will be destroyed, is different from the time of his second coming. And the time of his second coming is not exactly the same as the time of the end of the age. All of that we're going to treat in this, in this broadcast. No, I mean, we are not going to touch everything today, but in subsequent broadcasts, we are going to deal with all that. Praise the Lord. I hope you are following me. But the place where I want us to look at is let's examine. Are we in the end time? Are we in the time? Are we seeing signs that the Lord is coming? Amen. Praise the Lord. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, I just want you to know that the word Christ there means the anointed one. So many are going to come at the end of times claiming that they are the anointed one. And let me tell you, there are so many anointed in this time. So many people are putting themselves up, and you can really see power. But the power from which source? 
They are anointed, yes, but anointed by who? Remember, there is another person, another spirit that anoints people. It's called Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covered it. He also anoints. And Jesus is saying here, many are going to impersonify me and say, I am the anointed. Continue. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So he's saying that one of the sure signs we're going to know that we're in the end time is that you're going to have of wars, rumors of wars. Is there any time in a long time now that you can buy your newspaper or listen to the radio that you're not going to hear about war? If you are not hearing about war, you're going to be hearing about protest, social unrest. Somebody is on strike. Somebody is fighting somebody. One nation is fighting. One tribe is fighting. Some genocide. Continue. For nation shall rise against nation, mm. and kingdom against kingdom. Mm -hmm. And there shall be famines and pestilences, mm. and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, I want you to note that he said there shall be famine. I don't think to need to tell you. I don't need to expatiate on that. You know food shortages are all over the place. Now we are talking about global, global, global warming affecting the weather conditions. The, the one that I want to, you to note is the fact that earthquakes are happening in diverse places. When I was in school, when I studied geography a few years ago, when I was in school, the geography that we studied, we were told that there were certain areas that were earthquake-prone earthquake areas, and there were areas that are stable, that are not supposed to be earthquake-prone areas because of the, the geological formation in those areas. But can I tell you this? Over the last 20 years or so, those, those ideas have been totally rubbished. Because earthquakes are now appearing in areas that are not, that do not follow their theory at all. The, making this scripture to be very valid that earthquakes in diverse places. Continue. All these are the beginning of sorrow. All these are the beginning of sorrow. That means there is a period coming called the period of sorrow. Continue. Then shall they deliver you up to mm. be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I want you to know one of the signs of the age is terrorism. Terrorism all over the place in the name of religion. That's why it says here that ye shall deliver you up to be afflicted. Persecution of the righteous is a sure sign. Destruction of churches, how many times Christians have been persecuted? You know the story of what happened in southern Sudan, or was it Ethiopia, where a lady, because she decided to marry, convert to Christianity and marry a Christian, and she was pregnant, she was thrown in, in jail. And she's been said, it's been said that she, as soon as she delivers the child, they are going to uh, hang her. These are the fulfillment of, listen, the Bible is alive. And you, Christian, you better wake up. We, this is the time to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Continue. And then shall many be offended, mm -hmm. and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. That means there will be betrayal between, between brothers and sisters. He's not talking about betrayal by unbelievers now. It means that we Christians are going to betray one another. And you know what leads to betrayal? When we don't handle unfair treatment, what we consider unfair treatment correctly. Love covers multitude of sins. We ought to learn how to forgive ourselves and forgive and write early. And that is why I do not subscribe to all these prayers of uh, my enemy must die, my enemy must be killed, uh, the, uh, back to sender and all of that. Those things increase our propensity to, to react in the flesh. Jesus said, you have heard about a tooth for a tooth for an eye for an eye. He said, I cancel that law now. He now said, when you are slapped on one eye, you turn the other cheek. That means you do not retaliate. And when we do not retaliate, when we don't render evil for evil, it is easy for dissentment to die. He said, when your ways please the Lord, it will make your enemies to be at peace with you. 
But evidently, not a lot of us are going to be follow this, following this principle. So it will lead to bitterness, and bitterness will lead to betrayal. And betrayal will cause offenses, and the cycle will continue. Continue. And many false prophets shall rise, mm -hmm. and shall deceive many. Mm -hmm. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Ha! That another sad and painful sign here is that the zeal of Christians, that the, the zeal of our believers are going to start going down. He said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I pray for you that your love will not wax cold in the name of Jesus. I pray that the power of God will be quickened inside you. But as you are hearing my voice, the zeal and the love of God in you will rise in the name of Jesus. The forces of hell will not overcome you in the name of Jesus. The joy of the Lord is your strength in Jesus' name.